Hi, my name is Roxana Stefan and welcome to my bass studio. Today I'm going to talk to you about hard string moves when bowed. The Norwegian double bass player Knut Kutler, who was also my teacher at the Royal Conservatory in The Hague in the 90s, researched a lot of things about string playing and also the specific topic on how the string moves when it's bowed. Most string players don't really know what is happening when you are actually bowing your string. Intuitively, you will feel that when you play lower notes with low frequency, you need less bow speed, and when you play higher notes, you need more bow speed. The less observant player might not actually notice this, and they will play either note with same bow, which makes an unsatisfactory sound on either the low note or the high note. This is where the teachers come in, they will also tell you that when you play on low strings you need less bow speed and when you play on the higher strings you need more bow speed. But why is this? Did you ever ask yourself this? And how is this proven? Well that's what I'm going to talk about today. It is helpful to see how waveforms actually form in the string. If you look at the examples on this page, it represents a completely flexible string stretched between two fixed points and drawn upwards in the middle. The moment it is released, the angle in the middle will move outwards in both directions along the string at a speed which is determined by the mass of the string per unit of length and the tension in the string. If we look at example B, which is the second one from the top, the wave tops have nearly reached fixed points at either end. The string is exerting a constant force upwards on each of these points. In the next example, in C, the wave tops have just reached the attachment points for instruments that would be the nut and the bridge. And they start moving them downwards. They push them down. So you see the little arrows underneath. We imagine this movement to be so small that its influence on the string is not visible. But even two concrete walls would be microscopically moved by a string in this way. When we go down, we go in example D, the wave tops have moved down to the underside of the string where they continue their progress with the same speed as before. The wave tops are, however, slightly reduced in size as some of the energy will have transferred to the material to which the string is attached. On an instrument, the energy which goes into the bridge will be further transmitted to the belly, the bass bar, the sound post and the back, and so set the air in motion both inside and outside the body of the instrument. Most of the energy is nevertheless retained in the string and the wave tops continue their circular tours in two opposing directions. Moving to E, the wave tops meet at a point on the underneath of the string. But this happens without any transfer of energy or influence on one another. And so they continue via the next example F to the lower example G, where the attachment points of the string are this time forced a little upwards, exactly the reverse as C. Figure H shows how the wave tops once more arrive on the upper side of the string. And in I, they meet once more and give the string a form which is very similar to the initial position. The slight difference in height between A and I is due to the small fraction of energy that left the string and was transmitted to the fixed points at each end. The string has now gone through a whole cycle of vibration and the time it has taken to do this is called a period. If left unaffected by outer influences, it will continue to vibrate in the same manner until all energy has left it, the wave tops becoming gradually lower and lower. It should not be difficult to appreciate that if the string had been shorted by moving the fixed points nearer to each other, the time taken for one period would have been proportionately shorter because the wave tops would have had proportionally shorter distance to travel. This assumes constant tension and constant mass per unit of length of the string so that the wave tops travel at the same speed as originally.
So logically, if the string had been shortened by moving the fixed points nearer to one another, the time taken for one period would have been proportionately shorter because the wave tops would have had a proportionally shorter distance to travel. A shorter time per period will mean more periods per second, which equals higher frequency, which equals a higher note. If the length of the string is halved, the wave tops will only have half as far to go, thus doubling the frequency, which means it's a rise in pitch of an octave. Most string players will know that exactly in the middle of your string, between the nut and the bridge, is your octave. Before discussing the influence of the bow on the string, it is necessary to understand a little bit more about friction and the nature of contact between bow and string at the different points in the vibratory period. When a bow is drawn across the string, there are two different forms of friction. You have the sliding friction and you have the static friction. The sliding friction is when two bodies are in motion. The static friction is the resistance between two bodies which are at rest with each other. Sliding friction between two bodies is approximately proportional to the force which they exert to each other. On the other hand, the size of the contact surface makes no difference. Maximum potential static friction between two bodies is generally greater than the sliding friction between them. But in the same way as with sliding friction, it is also approximately proportional to the force the two bodies exert on each other and is independent of the size of the contact surface. These things are very important to realize that there's a difference between static friction and sliding friction and that there's greater force with static friction. This means when you start your bow on the string at rest, that you get a bigger punch than when you start sliding when you come from the air. This will become more relevant just a little bit later. The following experiments will help to reach a better understanding of sliding and static friction. In the next figure, it shows a wooden block resting on a table. A cord is attached to the block and the other end of the cord is connected to a two inch long spiral spring. The other end of the spring is screwed to a scale rule so that the extension of the spring can be read off at any time when the ruler is pulled away from the block. Experiment number one. First, it must be determined how far the spiral spring can be pulled out before the wooden block begins to slide. This will give an indication of how much static frictional resistance can be obtained. It is found that the block begins to slide every time the spring reaches 4 inches. At this moment, the pulling force is greater than the maximum static friction. Experiment number two. The pressure of the block on the table, and thus also the pressure of the table on the block, is increased by placing another slightly smaller block on top of the original one. Experiment one is repeated, so again, there's a static friction and they're going to pull and they're going to see how far you pull until it actually the block starts moving. Since there now is more pressure on the table, this time the spring can reach an extension of 5 inches before the blocks begin to slide. This shows quite clearly that the static friction can be increased when the weight on the table is greater. Experiment number 3. Starting again with only one block, as in experiment number one, this time the block is given a little push so that the sliding movement over the table has already started when the length of the spring is read off. This length turns out to be about three inches as long as the block is kept sliding by pulling on the ruler. So the sliding friction is less than the maximum static friction. The speed with which the ruler is pulled makes no difference to the result the spring reaches the same extension each time. Experiment number four. If the last experiment is repeated, but with the smaller block on top of the original one, it is found that the sliding friction also increases with increased pressure between the bodies. This is rather interesting because if the spring is pulled out to a length of about four inches, it can be done either 
with sliding friction and increased weight, or with the same amount of static friction, in which case not so much weight is required on the frictional surface between the block and the table. One block was enough. To continue with some new experiments, a string has been stretched between two fixed points and a bow is set up which can be drawn at a constant speed and with a constant pressure. Experiment number five. The bow is placed on the string and the pressure adjusted to a certain value so that the initial friction will be static. The bow does not move across the string. The bow is then set in motion lengthwise and the string accompanies it sideways until the maximum static friction is attained, at which moment the bow hair loses its hold on the string. So basically you have your bow on the string, you're pulling it sideways with your bow, but it's not sliding over the string, it's just pulling it with. The frictional resistance is now suddenly reduced because the form of friction has passed from static to sliding. The pressure of the bow on the string is kept constant the whole time. On account of its tension, the string rebounds rather quickly towards the imaginary straight line between the fixed attachment points. At the moment this happens, a wave motion is produced in the string. As the middle of the string, or the point of contact with the bow, moves from the side to which it was first pulled towards the other side, the horizontal force between the bow and hair and the string is reduced. At one particular moment, this is so little in comparison with the vertical force, the weight of the bow, that the friction suddenly becomes static once more, and the string again follows the bow hairs sideways, just as if they were glued together. This occurs at the moment when the horizontal force between bow hair and string has become less than the sliding friction caused by the pressure of the bow which in practice normally happens at the moment when one of the wave tops travels past the bow hair on the opposite side of the string, after being reflected by the bridge. The value of the sliding friction is equal to the product of the bow's force on the string, and the sliding friction factor, which is determined by nature of the two materials which are rubbing against each other. If this last phenomenon is compared with the earlier experiments with the blocks, we shall have to imagine that in experiment number three, part of the tension in the spring was suddenly lost so that this instantly retracted to less than three inches. The block would then stop moving because the force of the cord would no longer be great enough to keep it moving, the pulling force being less than the force of the sliding friction. If the ruler continued to be pulled, the block would remain on place until the length of the spring reaches four inches as in experiment number one. The block would then begin to slide and the spring would after a while again return to an extension of three inches. Experiment number six. The experiment is repeated, but this time the bow is not set in motion with the hair pressed against the string. The bow begins in the air above the string and is set in motion lengthwise. It is lowered only towards the string until the bow pressure used in experiment number five is attained. What happens now? Since the bow is already in motion relative to the string, while it is in the air, sliding friction is produced from the very first moment of contact. As the bow pressure increases, the friction of the motion increases and this means that the string is drawn further and further out to the side. But since only sliding friction has been produced, the string will never be drawn aside as far as was the case with static friction, as we saw in the first experiments. And what is worse, if the friction was completely even along the hair, the string would have remained at rest when it reached the point where the tension of the string was in balance with the frictional force. In practice, the situation is never quite so bad because the friction will never be perfectly even at all points on the hair. A series of slight recoils in the string occur close behind each other and each of these will start waves, which all pursue their paths around the string one after the other and the result will be an indeterminate sound reminiscent of ponticello or harmonic. 
And so the most important point is reached of all of this. In order to attain a distinct fundamental and pure sound, it is absolutely essential that the bow hair only loses its grip on the string once in the core of each vibrational period. This can be attained only by a periodical alternation between static and sliding friction. In practice, this means that sufficient pressure must be established before the bow starts to move lengthwise. It is essential to start with static friction. So after these two experiments with the block and the spring, and then placing a bow on the string as well, and looking at the static friction and sliding friction, and basically concluding that if you want to have a proper sound, you will always have to start with static friction on the string, which means every note should start with your bow on the string with weight on the bow. And then you release that and that will set the string in motion and then you can have the sliding friction to keep your sound going neatly. This was a very important lesson that I've learned from Knut and changed my playing for, uh, for the better. <laughs> Uh, a lot of people start notes, especially beginners, from the air and they basically make these wavy forms and I always tell my students you, that the string playing should actually be on and then you release and then you stop again. So no smiley faces, but rather a frowny face. Um, and with this little research that he did, this little experiment, he actually proves that that is the way to go. So that's all I want to give you today because uh, otherwise I'll be talking to you for an hour. If you still have questions about this and uh, you go like I have no clue what you're talking about but I would love to know more, you can contact me and you can leave comments below. Um, yeah and I hope you enjoyed this little introduction actually because this was only one third of the whole experiment that I now shared with you because after this he still talks about bow speed and the influence and pitches and how to make bowings accordingly to all this research that he did and but i'll be putting those videos out soon as well and i hope you enjoyed it and see you again